Dear family and friends in Christ, may God's strength be with you. May He nourish you each and every day. May you know the full assurance that He is always with you. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending forth your Son, Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, the Emmanuel, God with us. Help us each day to celebrate that promise, the, the promise that you, are never, that you are never far from us, but always near to us. Lord, may you lead our lives and guide us. May you bless us now with your holy presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Almost two years ago, there was a cruise ship that set out across the Mediterranean uh, that was full of passengers from around the world who had come to see the various sites and the various different places along the, 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 that, that great sea. Now maybe some of you know the name of the ship. It was con called the Costas Concordia. Now I'm imagining that if you know the name, if you recognize the name, it's not because of the beautiful views that the people saw or the, the magnitude of the ship or well, even the just the greatness of, and splendor that, they, uh, that was around them. But if you recognize the name of that ship, the Costas Concordia, you might recognize the name as the, being the ship that crashed into a reef outside of Tuscany. It hit a reef at, at going pretty good amount of speed, so much so that passengers throughout the ship witnessed this sound, this sound that shook the ship and the sound that, that made them grab hold, grab tight for fear. Maybe you remember that as in this ship, this Concordia Costas, this Costas Concordia, that the people were on the ship for many hours, some of them even for more than hours, but even days, as they sat in darkness, without food, without water, even without facilities. To add insult to injury, Captain Chitino, which he made the news definitely, he knew better than what he did. To add insult to injury, he, instead of immediately calling the Coast Guard, immediately calling for help, he tried to get the ship back on to course because he didn't want to be found off course. See, in the ship, they had a computerized navigation system that would have safely allowed and steered them around the reef. But Captain Chitino, he said he knew better than that ship's computer. He knew those seabeds so well that he could take the ship on his own to the fear, to the anguish of many people. They crashed into that reef and many lives were taken. Thankfully the Lord spared many but there were th those who lost family members that day. How often is it that we like to take go off course? That we like to take the wheel of our lives? That we like to direct our own selves? That, that we, like Captain Shatina, we think we know where the reeves of our lives are. And so we take the bridles away from God. We take that wheel from Him. And we direct ourselves. He's given us His Word. He's given us His Holy Spirit for daily direction. But how often do we ignore those things? How often do we find ourselves directing the ships of our lives on our own? Because we believe we know better. We believe we know where the, the, the trouble spots are. It's interesting. Martin Luther, he kind of made an observation about this some time ago. And he talked about all of creation recognizing God's direction, but not man. He said, everything reveres the word of God through which it was created, except for man and the devil. It's kind of an interesting judgment, isn't it? And we see that to play out in Scripture as well. How often did Jesus in Scripture use the example of nature to try to direct the people to faith? He talked about the sown field, trusting in God. The, the, the vine and the branches growing faithfully, sprouting. He talked about the way that the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, follow God. Look at the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. They neither sow nor reap, weave nor spin, and yet your heavenly Father feeds and clothes them. How much more will he do so for you? Throughout Scripture, Jesus uses an example like this. Uh, there are examples in the Old Testament as well that show us how creation faithfully follows God, but how man, God's greatest creation, does not. Think about us as God's greatest creation. He not only spoke us into being, but he formed us from the dust of the ground. He breathed into us life-giving breath. And yet, ironically, it's the rest of creation that falls before him on their knees. The rest of creation that honors him. And isn't that what the psalmist was getting at in Psalm 107 today? He got at that, that difficulty that we have, that, that difficult irony that we have of God's creation. Man and woman 
versus the rest of creation. Now it starts out just pretty simply, and it, I encourage you to turn to your bulletins now because we're going to be looking through uh, Psalm 107. But as we look at verse 23, we see just this day-to-day -day life almost. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. Nothing strange there is there. It's, it's something we expect. Uh, and people did business on the waters. We know that from the very beginning of time that civilization, civil, civilization, if I can say that, would grow up around water. Civilization grew up around water. We learned to control water. We learned to send rafts and boats up and down the uh, rivers. Even the Phoenicians were able to uh, go across the Mediterranean Sea as they went out there with their boats and ships. We've learned to control water, to direct it, even in our desert land, to irrigate our fields. But then quickly, things change. Notice how fast the psalmist turns that on its head. Here the people were just doing business, going about their day-to-day -day lives. And all of a sudden, we come to verse 24. They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. For He commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Truly these people, even though they thought they were captains of their own lives, that they were masters of their own destiny, truly they realized how quickly they were out of control. Truly they realized how the water was powerful, how those waves could smash against their boats, how, how much fear that still instilled in them. And how true that is, isn't it? How true that is not just for those who literally are out on the water, out on the sea, but how true it is for us in the storms of life as we face those storms. We go about our business, our day-to-day -day business. We go through God's creation. We go around, it's all around us. It's right above us, right below us, but we hardly notice it. We've, kept, we've, we've put God's creation to use. We use our cars to travel across it, our trucks, our trains. We use the air that he's given us to fly our planes and our jet fighters. We use the waters to send out our ships and our boats to transport goods, to protect our land and our trade. But we hardly ever notice it. We hardly ever notice it until the earth quakes beneath our feet, before we, until we have to grab hold, until the airplane rocks, and all of a sudden we have to steady ourselves. How many of us Notice creation. Notice the beauty, the might of creation until something happens. How many of us would think a second thought about a bacteria cell until it infects our body, giving us a cold and the flu or the flu and, and we can't until we, that we can't get rid of? How many of us think about viruses that infect our body or cells that get out of control until the doctor tells us that diagnosis? So often, we neglect to notice God's creation. We neglect to notice all that he's doing around us. And I wonder why that is. Why is it? Is it just because we want control of our own lives? I don't think so. I think that it's in this creation that we struggle so much. That even though we'd never outright admit it as Christian people, but we struggle to see God's work in creation. We do struggle to see him active. We might be able to easily say, yes, he created the world. He did a beautiful job. But we struggle to see how he's there when the, the, when the storms literally take our homes, when disasters take our families and, our, and even take the lives of our friends. And we struggle. And I wonder if it's because we struggle to see God's hand at work. We struggle to see the work of God in his creation. We wrestle with that back and forth. We have the self-absorption going about our day-to-day -day business and, and yet we cry out to God when things aren't going our way. But that's not God's desire. His desire isn't just that we cry out to him when the storms of life hit. His desire isn't for us to just cry out to him when we're about to hit the reefs and, and destroy the, the ship we call life. His desire is that we all, always see him around us. His desire is that we are always recognize his presence with us, that we always are coming to him, that in all things that we come before him, his desire is not that we don't see him, but we see how much he's with us, how much he does for us. And this goes back to the beginning, doesn't it? Because Adam and Eve, it wasn't God who abandoned them in the garden, was it? It was Adam and Eve who ran from him. The people of Israel, God never abandoned them. 
They went back to Egypt. The people of Israel, as they were leaving, how many times did they turn to golden calves? But God stayed with them. We know the faithfulness of Moses, though, is kind of a neat thing because he tells us that even as God was present with the people, he said, I'd rather you be present with us, Lord, than enter the promised land. Let me read to you from Exodus 33. <clears throat> if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people of the face of the earth? Even Moses realized how important it was God was present with them. He was present in his sanctuary in the temple. But truly, the culmination of God's presence with his people came when he sent Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God with you and God with me. That coming Savior that he had promised of old, the Messiah that we prepare, prepare our hearts for during this Advent season. We prepare for God who took on human flesh. He didn't just merely come as a spirit. He didn't just merely come as an idea or an imagery, but he came in flesh. He took on human form. Paul says, Colossians chapter 2, the fullness of the deity dwells bodily among us. Jesus took on our flesh because he had to take on our flesh. Jesus took on our flesh because he had to take our flesh to pay the price. As sin entered the world through one man, sin could only be paid for through one man. Paul says that in Romans. That promised payment came through Christ. That promised payment that he would care for us and take care of us. When Jesus took on human flesh, he came and he brought healing to the sick strengthening of faith to the people. I'd like to take you to another time out on the sea. The disciples and Jesus, they'd had a long day, and they had taken the boat out. It was evening, and it was windy, and the, the waves were rocking the boat. The wind was howling in their ears, and the disciples were afraid. They looked, and they saw Jesus. He was sleeping in the front of the boat, they woke him up and they said, Jesus, Jesus, help us, save us. They didn't cry out because they trusted him, but in despair and fear. Jesus, he stood up and he made the storm be still and the waves and the sea were hushed. Those are words from Psalm 107. God stilled the waves. Jesus, true God, stilled the waves among them. He stilled the waves in their hearts. And still the disciples weren't sure. They didn't quite understand. It wasn't until he paid the price on the cross that they actually got it. Until he paid the price and rose from the grave that they understood, no, this was God. God with his people in a very real way. God with his people conquering death. God with his people controlling the wind, controlling the waves. God with his people hushing those winds. You know, it's interesting because we know those stories of the Old Testament. We know those stories of the New Testament of God's presence with us. You would think we wouldn't have any excuse, but we do. We so often do find ourselves thinking about where is God in the midst of our trials. I encourage you to see him as there. I want to share with you just before we wrap up today. There's a reporter in Utah, and her name was Megan Morgenstein. And she did an article on a, a, this off-duty cop. And this off-duty cop, off cop name was Kevin Peck. He heard a bus hit a person. He was around the corner, and he came running around the corner. And he looked for the body in front of the bus. He looked for the body next to the bus, but all he saw was the white tennis shoe of the person sticking out from under the bus. Being the police officer he was, being faithful to his job and vocation, he got down. He shimmied under the bus on his hands and on his belly. The ground was icy. It was December 11th of last year. He shimmied on the ground to check her pulse. He put his hand out and he felt her pulse and, and, he, and he realized she was there. In his own words, he said she was scared. But he told her, I'll stay with you. And Officer Peck, he kept and held her hand until the fire crews were able to jack that bus up off of her and, the, and they were able to pull her out. And the reason I share that with you because it reminds me of exactly what Jesus does for us. He doesn't just grab our hand, but he actually takes on the weight of our sin, the crushing weight of our punishment, and he bears it for us. He replaces our sin and our punishment and gives us life instead. He clutches our hand through those times that are terrible and scary and awful. 
He says, I'm with you. I know you're scared. I know you don't know how this is going to turn out, but I do. I do because I'm with you. I do because I came once and I'm coming again for you, my children. That's the promise he gave you in your baptism. That's the promise that we have each and every day. I, I know it's true. We don't have the presence of God like, like the disciples did. We, we can't sit down and have a fish fry with him on, on Sunday morning. We can't sit down and, 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 uh, and, and see him in the front of our boats or in the, in the car next to us. But what we do know is that he is always present with us. We do know that he has made us that promise, that he is there with you and with me, that he is there and in a very beautiful and real way. He comes and he is with us in that gift of the Lord's Supper. In a very real and beautiful way, he gives us his body and blood. He takes that crushing weight of sin and lifts it off of us and replaces, us with, replaces that with his forgiveness, with new life in him. So life with God. Life as we prepare for his second coming. It's good. It's a good life. It's a life that we have a promise and a, and a hope. It's a life that we look forward to the day when we will no longer feel the pain and, and, and suffering of death, but we will know him forever. And so as the psalmist closed up our reading from today, we can say with him, with those of old, oh, let us give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of elders. Let us lift up our praises to our Advent King, who is with us. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, I give thanks to you that you are always with us, that you are present with us everywhere, and even in those times when we run from you, when we, when we think we can direct our own lives, reassure us of your forgiveness. Lead us to repentance. Lead us to turn back and to know your guidance and direction. Most of all, Lord, lead us to look to you as the one who bore our sins and shame, the one who bore the cross that we would have life. Lord, as we prepare for your coming in Christmas, lead us to live our lives with you, not only this day, not only through these weeks leading up to Christmas, but every day, knowing you are there. Let us see you in your creation, and see your hand at work. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.